Hello, my name is Chris Hightower. Around where I live, most people call me the Q Man because I've been repairing and building queues for quite a while now. I've also sell equipment to other people and teach them how to repair and build queues. On this video, I'm going to take you basically through your basic queue repair, how to put on tips, ferrules, rewrap queues, clean a shaft, get mix out of them, retaper them, put a joint in a butt, make a sneaky peek, put a joint in a shaft, uh, do a turn on a butt, etc. Put on a butt plug. So we're going to have to get going in order to accomplish all of this in a short time. So I'm going to familiarize you with your lathe a little. If you have one of my lathes, or not, it'll the features will be very similar. This is your headstock on your lathe. This is what you chuck all of your work up in to turn. You have a you have a key. Some some chucks work with a turn key. This one the scroll spins around the back to open it and close it. Then we'll move to your left. This is the motor right behind it. You have the off on switch. It's right on this side of this. Back here, you have an additional steady rest for the lathe. This is to steady the shaft when you run a shaft through for doing uh, tip and ferrule work. This is your cross slide. It has a, uh, a cutting tool in here. It has a one thousandths calibration cross slide that goes across it. If you bought a cross slide and put it on your wood lathe from me, it probably has five thousandths on each one of these notches. You have to remember when you're doing turns that if the notch says one thousandth, you move it in one thousandth. Since your work is rotating, it will take two thousandths off the total diameter. This knob takes it up and down the bed. On this particular lathe here, you have about three and a half feet between centers. I designed it specially for doing Q work. And I noticed the 36 inch lathe, 37, were just not quite enough. It made the work a lot harder to do. This is an additional steady rest. You notice there's a plastic insert in here. You get several of these inserts and you make them up for different sizes to where you can hold your different size pieces for doing your joint work. This here is your tail stop. Now tail stops work different ways. This particular model works with lever action. And then it tightens down with Allen screws. So your basic things you'll need to work on, you'll have to have some Allen wrenches, uh, a utility knife, which will come, which you will do much of your work with your utility knife. You have to have your chuck for drilling. You have to have your concave live center when you clean shafts, retake them, etc. If you're going to work with wood cutting tools, which I don't recommend it if you have the cross slide because the cross slide's so much easier, you have to put your uh, steady rest for your wood cutting tools. You have to have a gouge for doing your rough turn. You need a skew for finishing them up. I'm going to show you how to do most of the work in this video with the wood cutting, I mean with the uh, metal cutting bit. I've already made a video in the past on uh, on the wood cutting tools and I've had many requests for this one so I'm going with it. You also need a file whether you're working with the metal tools or the wood cutting tools. You also have a wrapping motor on the lathe. I'll throw the belt on. You throw the mounted right in here you put the uh, belt from the pulley on it to the big pulley on your motor. 
You'll notice it runs in the opposite direction, the lathe runs. You can start out real slow or speed it up for doing your wrap work. You also have to have you a set of thousandths calipers. You can use dial or not. I prefer the dial calipers. You'll need a set of lathe pans, which come with your lathe if you get your lathe from me, to cover your main screw. You'll need several grades of sandpaper. You'll need some tip glue. Of course, you'll need tips. You'll need some ferrules little joint ring material, etc., and, and something to work on. On this particular lathe, you have a storage cabinet here. It's got a little lock on it. You also need some shaft cleaner. I always just take some kind of spray bottle and put my shaft cleaner. I keep a, a thing of water. You'll need just plain water. Need you some five-minute epoxy. And, of course, some paper towels. And if you're going to go into the queue building end of it and not just repair, you'll also have to have a pointed live center to go in your tailstock. Well, I think we'll we'll go ahead and take you through first how to put on a tilt and ferrule, cut a tenon. We'll get set up to do that in just a second. Okay. Now I'll show you how to use your steady rest back here. First you slide your shaft through it. It's a little too far back. You line this particular steady rest with fail. You dump your other one unless you're polishing out a bud. Take your Allen wrench, you slide it through to the point. You notice I have a new shaft that I'm building here. You also have these little collars, plastic collars that you slip around the shaft. If it doesn't turn true enough with that on it, the jaws on this particular chuck are concave to where it can handle it. Like I say, I designed this lathe especially for working on cues. So there's a lot of features that wouldn't be compatible with doing a lot of metal work, but it's, it's excellent for doing cue work. You also will need a pencil as you do your work. I've marked this cue right here with uh, 29 inches. I want to mark me a one inch mark here. I'm already going to face it off across the front to that point. I need me a one inch mark to where I know how far I need to cut this tenon back. it in a little better to where I have a, a good line. Need to lock this steady rest back here in. Okay, and I'll run my tool up here. First thing I'm going to do is face it off to where I have the not turning real true with that collar on there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the uh, collar off and just run it right down on the shaft. I would say your third speed is as fast as you ever want to run it. 
Now I'll check the inside diameter of my ferrule. 312, which is about 5 sixteenths. Check this, and I'm at uh, 342. So I've got to go 30 thousandths, so that'd be 15, but I'm not going to dial the whole 15 in at once. We'll go ahead and get you up a little closer on this. the uh, the wood lathe that's been modified for doing Q work you want to be real careful because it's easy to go too far now a little trick if you go too far with it take you a paper towel just a little short piece of it and wrap it around here and spray water on it and it'll swell it out and then take and put a dry paper towel on it spin it dry it up and then you'll be ready to uh, You'll be ready to cut it back down right, or sand it, depending on how much you have to go. Now you have to come in here, and you have this tool turned where only the tip is touching both ways. So it's set at slight angle. You go in here and you do your face off. A good flat surface there. Right. Now you stop it. Check the ferrule, you look around it, you see, no, there's no, no daylight, that's what you want. Check the length, make sure you got it an inch. So I need to go just one more little pass in there. shaft I'm putting a uh, thick wall Muchi ferrule. You'll get a lot of repair work from the Muchi cues because they use a soft ferrule with a thin wall. Well I buy the thick wall Muchi ferrules and cut the tenon down to a uh, 5 sixteenths and put the thick wall where it has more strength but still gives you that soft tip they're famous for. Now we're going to mix up a little two-part epoxy and put it on here in order to save time you know, mixing two parts is the same. I'm just going to go ahead and do that and not waste the film showing you how to mix the glue. Okay, now I've got the glue all mixed up. You just 50 50. Come in here, put it on your tenon. You notice I have the shaft out of the lathe. I like to do this because I like to be able to pound the ferrule down on to where I know there's. Uh, no room. Plus, I, I do tournament work some, and I can't afford to tie the lathe up while this dries. Put it down, grab your paper towel, and wipe the excess glue off. Give it a good cleaning up. Now what I do is I take another ferrule, and I set the, the shaft down on something that won't hurt, and I take a hammer, I set that ferrule on top, and pound it down. We'll give that a few minutes to 
dry and we'll come back and cut it down for the tail home. Okay, I've got the shaft back in there. It's dried pretty good. So I'm going to pull my tool down here. tool in there and do this. I don't have a good left hand tool sharpened right now so I'm going to go ahead and do it with the right hand tool. Now if you were using the wood cutting tools you'd be using the gouge for your main turns. Right, I went to the wood on one side and it didn't touch the wood on the other side. That means it's turning off just a little bit. So I'm going to rotate it about a quarter of a turn, leave the tool exactly where it is, run it down it again. And right, I'm going to stop it, check it again. Just got it off about half of it. Now sometimes the shaft will just not let you get a true enough turn. So I turn another quarter of a turn. I have one little spot there. Turn it another quarter of a turn. One little spot there that didn't come out. Very tiny. So I'm going to take the file, file is kind of dirty. I'm going up to the clean end. Whether you're using wood cutting tools or this, you always use the file. Another little thing that works good, take your little 220 sandpaper, put it on the front of the file, wrap it around it, another trick that you can do, which I've already got it with that, is you can wet that high spot just put a little spit on it, a uh, little piece of paper towel, wet it and swell it up to size and sand it down even, which is a good way to do it. Now I'm going to come in here and hit this with a little 220 to smooth it up. You notice I'm smoothing it before I face the front off. That way if I round that front off a little bit, I'm okay. Grab a piece of uh, 400, 600, just watch your fingers on these jaws. What you can do to make these jaws not hurt you as bad is I, you can take a heavy piece of sandpaper like this and run it on the outside of the jaws until you smooth them up a little bit where they don't have the sharp corners. Now I've got that good and smooth. I'm going to bring back the tool. Now if you were facing this off with the wood cutting tools, you would be using your skew, run it across like this, and then come back at in at an angle and set the front of it on it. Keep 
taking little passes till you hit the till you hit the wood. I like using a one inch ferrule on my cue, so I'm cutting this one a good bit back. Normally I put a little stronger ferrule on the cues that I build than Mewtwo's, but in my area there's been a lot of people that like that high action, real soft hit that Mewtwo gives you. So in order to please them, I'll put a Mewtwo ferrule on one of the cues I build once in a while. Take, we're going to take a tip. We're going to sand the back of it until you don't see any of the thing. Now I recommend on the LaPros, the Elkmasters, and the Triangles to take a flat jaw vise that's got smooth jaws and to press them a little bit before you put them on. What, it, what will the pressing, pressing it down, you put the glue only on the back of the till. Don't put the glue all over everything else. Move your tool post out of the way here. Move it on down here to where it's out of the way. They can stick the till to the front of it. Try to center it as close as you can. Now with this quick gel glue, it dries fast, so you don't have a lot of play time with it. You get it centered, put the pressure, get it to grab, then move your tail stock down, and lock it in place. it in, then you grind that live center up against the front of it, and oh well, I slid it backwards. I really recommend using your, uh, your little collar when you do the tips, not when you're doing the ferrules. So I probably skimped that shaft just a little bit, but I'll, I'll sand it out, slid it out, whatever I have to do to it. Yeah, when I, whenever you're doing tip work and not ferro work, always use the collar. Always use the collar anyway if it gives you a true enough turn. Especially if you're going to be putting pressure with this. Once you get the pressure, you lock this screw down, let it sit for a few minutes. Sometimes 60 seconds is enough. I like to wait two or three minutes. And it just drives. Leave your pressure. Slide the tail stock out of your way. Slide your cross slide down just past it a little bit. What you're going to do when you come in here, you're going to use this to rest your utility knife in like this. What I'm going to do, I'm going to slide that tip. I'm, I stopped it enough and put a collar on it, but I'm going to slide a little more of the tip out the front. You want to be back close to where everything turns real true for doing ferro work, but it's not as critical. So you got, you know, close to two inches stuck out here is about the right amount to work with. I'll lock my wrist back here back down. Flip it on. You're on the third or fourth speed for cutting a tip. Third to the fourth slopes. So you just come in the back. Just come in the back side with the tracer blade while you're standing it up here. Cut it even with the ferrule. You're getting the angle of the blade sitting on flat. Alright, now. 
I always take the razor blade once it's too dull to, uh, to cut a tip, and I'll take and set it aside. And I'll take that same razor blade back out, because it's still sharp enough for this application. Now yeah, I'm having a hard time seeing it. much takes care of doing a ferrule. Now we'll move on to cleaning shafts. Okay, for cleaning a shaft, you have to take your shaft pin, match it up. This particular one here is a 5 16 18. Stick it in your shaft. Stick it in the chuck. And tighten the chuck up. Now you want to run the back of your little shoulder on this pin up against the front of the jaws. That way if there's any slipping, it won't turn loose. The very first shaft I ever worked on, I broke it. I had a friend of mine that picks at me to this day calling me the brake cue man because I did that instead of the cue man. But I haven't broke one since. That's the reason I come up with this large concave live center. At the time, everybody always used a small concave live center on all the repair lathes that were on the market. And I come up with this large one because I wanted something that would not let the tip throw out very easily. And also, you could run the large one up against the rubber bumper on a butt when you were doing wraps. So it served a two-fold purpose. Now, you lock this in good and tight, pull in the lever pressure, with your tip in there, and then lock it down. A lot of times a shaft will look like it has a little wobble, but what it is is it's not seating up on the pin and everything's not exactly concentric. So that's not a problem. First thing I'm going to do with this shaft, since it's a good bit dirty, I'm going to hit it with a little 400 sandpaper. Then I'm on. I would normally go into it with some cleaner right here, but up here where I nicked it from that, I'm going to take a. I'm going to show you how to take a nick out of a shaft. Now there's two or three ways to do it. One way is to take your water, make you a piece of uh, paper towel the size of the neck, lay it on it, spray it with water. Now for serious nicks, even if I'm going to steam them out, I'll do this. 
If you run into a shaft, the whole shaft is just nicked all up. Take, take paper towels, roll it all the way around it, and then spray it down until you have that soap. Okay, this one doesn't need that. We don't want to swell the wood that much. And let that sit for several minutes in order to swell out most of those dents and then come in and start picking the ones that are still left and doing either this to it or the steaming operation. See, these are fresh, so they come out pretty easy. That one almost steamed out just in that short time. But water is what removes nicks. Another way of doing it is to wet your piece of paper towel, also a bag like a grocery sack, some of that type of paper works good. Wet it and sit there while it's spinning and cause it to steam. Now that'll remove minor nicks, but that won't get the big ones out. Still have a little bit there. So I'm going to come in, I'm going to come in with the big gun now. I'm going to come in with a steamer. can't find one of these steamers locally, give me a call and I'll try to I'll try to pick you one up. I usually keep one or two in stock. Sometimes I've been as long as a year unable to find them, but if, if they're available in my area, I'll sell you one. But it's a lot better than a regular iron, although the results are no better than an iron. You can use an iron and a wash rag. But the downfall to that is you have that hot iron. This thing, I can unplug it and go with it right then. All right, now I'm ready to clean it. I'll take me a whole paper towel. I've already 400 it. It would be a good idea to run over that area right there with 400 before I clean it, see how smooth it actually is. I'm probably going to have to come back in and sweat that one some, but I'm going to go on with it. Get this done, I can come back to that later. I'm going to have to lay something in that and let it sit for several minutes. We've let that sit. We'll pull that off. I swole it out pretty much. Good and smooth. Now, I'm going to get my whole paper towel. I'm going to spray shaft cleaner on it. Normally, I sell this stuff in a regular bottle, so I would suggest you get you a uh, regular bottle, get you a spray bottle of some sort. Also, while you're cleaning, if you feel a little nick, just run over that section with it while you're running. All the grease and everything I had on this shaft from my shop where I was building them, it's all coming right out. See how dirty that's getting from all the all that is pulling out. Sometimes you have to really soak it. And sometimes it's best to let it sit a second if you've got a real dirty shaft. Spray it real wet and just turn the lathe off and let it sit a second. You notice the 400 sandpaper hardly touched this stuff when I first run over it because it gummed up real quick. We'll let that spin a second as it's, as it's drying out. What this will do is pull all the stuff to the surface and crystallize on the surface and then you just come back with your 400 and knock it right off. Sometimes shafts are better just to use six and not use four. Since I'm in the finishing stages of smoothing this one up and all from building it, I'm going to use four. Just 
is for the extra smoothing factor. A lot of times when you clean a customer's shaft, you'll only need to use six. Moving to six. You see a little dust coming up now. It's because it's drying out and all that stuff that was crystallized is coming up. When you start seeing that powder flaking off, you'll know that you'll know that it's dry and you're knocking it off now. Now I take a paper towel, a piece of one anyway, and I wipe the dust off. Also what you're doing when you run this paper towel, this paper towel, you notice I'm putting pressure, I'm putting two fingers, then pressing on those two fingers, I'm burnishing the shaft in with the paper towel. Now the cheap paper towels will fall apart on you, so I'm saying use bounty or something really tough. Now I'm going to come in with the Q-Wax. I have some French polish that I can use on it. I'll sell you a little bottle of that if you need it. But unless I've done some heavy sanding, like retapering a shaft, I don't worry about sealing it with the polished sealer. I just run the Q-Wax on it. Because when you run this Q-Wax and you get it warm, you keep it on there until it really works it in. And you don't need much. Just enough to where you can see you have just a little bit on your paper towel. Just enough to get a thin coat over that entire shell. When you hand this back to a customer, it's going to feel like silk running through their fingers. Me, I normally charge, if I have to steam nicks out seven to ten bucks, if I just clean it up and wax it, I charge about five normally they'll be coming back to you over and over to get their shelf to fill and slick like that again. Now if you were going to retaper a shaft, let's say somebody it, it was uh, got fat quick but they like the long pro taper like this shaft has on it. What you do is come in with some 180 some of this back stuff like sanding belts or, uh, or some of the stuff that comes in a roll with a cloth back and come in here, this already has the taper I need on it, and it takes a good while to taper one, but you start pulling it back, pulling it back, pulling it back, pulling it back, and checking it. You can stop the lathe. Normally I eyeball it until I get it to where I want it. Once you have this, just start pulling it back, and you can stop the lathe and check it. Just keep pulling it back, pulling it back, until you get it like you want it, until you get the right taper. Go just a few thousandths larger than you want to with this and then stop and run it up and down the shaft because the great sandpaper you're using will remove those scratches, the circular scratches. Run up and down long ways to remove them. Then step down to about some 220. You're going maybe 120, 180, 220. And then you do the same thing. Sand it. Now you're doing the smoothing part. That's why you want to be five or ten thousandths larger than you actually want to be when you come down to the, when you're finishing with your first. Then you'll sand it with the grit, run back and forth, smooth it up. Then go on down 320, 400, 600. Use the polished sealer on the shaft. Then take some uh, 600 and knock the surface of that off. That way what's in the pour stays there. Knock the surface off. Another way to retaper a shaft is to take the shaft out, run it through the headstock, take your tool, go up and cut the ferrule down to the size you want and a little past the ferrule. Then turn, get you a left hand cutting tool, one made to cut from left to right. A right hand cuts from right to left and a left hand cuts from left to right. Say so cut it down to the size you want, just a few thousandths larger. Turn the shaft around and run it back through the headstock. 
I'll try to give you a quick example of what I'm talking about. Without going into it fully. So I want to get on to the joint work and on I'm going to be out of time. You've already got this turned down to say 12 and a half millimeters or whatever. Run, run it through there, tighten it down, run your live center into the uh, screw. Use your pointed center and run it into this. Then take your left hand cutting tool, carry it in until you touch, and then start coming back. Then run it through some more, back up, do another cut. And just keep doing that until you've pulled your taper. And then you can use both hands at the same time in order to go out and just and just come out a little bit, turning the knobs in opposite direction to get the taper, and then come put it back in between centers and finish it by hanging. If you have to take a lot off, that's the way to get the quick meat off the front of the shaft. Now we're ready to start dealing with rails. Notice I have it uh, chucked up. I have an insert or a uh, metal piece that slips over the threads chucked up in here and I have the uh, butt screwed into that and I use the pointed live center and run it into the butt. If you want to use, some of them doesn't have a screw with a hole threaded in it like my cues do. So you might want to use a uh, your large concave live center and run it up against the end of the rubber. I'm going to sand this lightly with 220. I'm using the foot control. For this operation, you could use the lathe instead of the foot control would be fine. hear that clicking when that motor, something inside of it clicks when you run it backwards for a second. I'm not an electrician, so I don't understand about alternating poles and all that stuff, so but it doesn't hurt anytime. I have the uh, lathe still on the third speed. And I have the motor going from the uh, wrapping motor up to the large pulley on the uh, motor. Now the first thing I want to do is take and drill me two 1 16th inch holes. I use a little portable drill, that way I don't have to start looking for a drill and trying to plug it in and all of that. And this is lightweight and easy to carry around. A regular drill works just fine. I found sometimes spinning too fast you can wind up nicking the finish there. And with this I very rarely ever mess anything up. So if you nick the finish that means you've got to polish it out which that about doubles the time on your job. Now I've got I've got the high spot sanded out. It's time we need to take some white glue. Don't get school glue. And don't get wood glue, get the white glue, which is in between the two. It's regular Elmer's white glue. The school glue is too soft. It will, it will wash away too easy. Now smooth that out with your fingers. your fingers off. Now I keep my, I'm going to show you this contraption I feel. It's got my, it's on roller bearings to feed my string up. If you don't have something to feed it, you're going to be snagging a lot. You'll snag some even with this. I got me a little glue. Now I want to fill that hole up with that glue. Make sure I got me a good line of glue running around here. I want to 
to get the I want to get glue all over that string before I start sticking it in the hole. Now there's not much of a way for you to see exactly what I'm doing since I'm not left-handed. But I'm just basically doubling. I'll try to put it in left-handed. And then you just stick it down in there with it. And you take a few toothpicks, just keep running it in, breaking them off. And I have a little sharp tool that I made up. You can make one out of a nail or a punch or most anything. And you want to press that down in there with that sharp tool. Just as much of it as you can get in there. Once you've, you've probably made the, got it pressed in where there's room for more toothpick, always dip the toothpick in glue. Run it down in there. This uh, finish, this glue is starting to dry out, so I'm just going to kind of hit it with a little water. Now, if you have it, it'll bubble up on you and, and roll up under your string, but don't worry about it. It, it wipes right off your finish. All right, now I've got that in there good. I'm going to wind it a turn. I'm going to lay it over, pull it real tight that first turn. Lay it right up to that part. Do two or three rounds by hand. Till I know that I've got that whole area right there pushed up against the end. That way you hide that hole real well. All right, now I'm ready to run it. I'll hold the line with my left hand. And I'm going to put more tension with my left hand than I am my right. I'm going to use the right mainly as a guide and the left to hold the tension. Well, see, I went too far. So you pull it. I overlapped a little. Anytime you snag, you'll overlap some. And I snag. Now I want to rewind the spool down to where I don't have anything that can uh, that can snap as I start going. Now I recommend using the thinner linens like Blue Mountain, etc. I'm not going to knock anybody else's product and not and tell you what the names of the ones I don't recommend are. But I recommend you go with the thinner linens. Blue Mountain is one of the better ones. There's some that actually come from Ireland that are real good, but they're hard to find also. You just run it down. If you've seen me mess up once, hopefully I'll make it on down to the end before I mess up. Nope. Talk too soon. Just pull it back. See how nice that's going on there? Now, when you're pulling it, you're kind of pulling back at an angle. I'm rewinding that spool down there with my foot. So I'm holding it back at an angle to where it goes right up against the last thread every time. That'll cause you to overlap sometimes. I like running from the big end to the small. A lot of other people would rather run from the small to the big. I don't know that it makes any difference, just my preference. So now run on past it. Now I'll take my utility knife and I'll snip it. I'm going to wind back and I'm going to get it off of the top of the finish and back down in that last groove. Now I'm going to I'm going to look down here and see where my hole was. Okay, 
so I'm right on top of my hole right now. Right there it is. That worked out good. If it don't, you can kind of pull back on the linen. Just keep pulling it back. Take your little sharp tool and go down in the hole. And then come in with one of your toothpicks. Fill the hole up with glue. Get the linen press down there, break that piece of toothpick off. Come in here with your knife and snip it. On the other end, I was able to shove all I had down there in it because I'd already snipped it pretty close. On this end, you'll always have to cut it. I'm just pressing the toothpick down in there breaking it off. Use your tool to keep going further. And when you're done, I'm going to try to work from up here to where you can see. I'm going to take and go in between the threads near that and mash them up against the edge, pulling way back down in there. Just laying just a tiny amount of space between those in order to push it up against the end. And when I press the linen out and it goes flat, all of that will meet up together. And it'll be real hard to even see the hole up at this end. Now for the pressing. You need a few things for pressing. Number one, you need water. A lot of times I will take and lay a paper towel under this. Like so when I'm ready to press it. Just to keep all the water off everything. You'll need a paper towel handy to clean up with as you're spraying your water on it. And you'll need, I put two oak boards and run a screw through the end of them and put a little spacer in and I got, I've got the uh, lock washer, I mean lock nut, or, and then I just tighten it down Then I'll be able to slip that around here and run it. Slow the motor down to its slowest speed and pull that belt off the wrapping motor. I normally just wrap my wrapping motor belt around the wrapping motor, that way I know where it's at. And then you want to come in here and wet this thing down. You'll do the first press before you worry about any little birds. Normally the Blue Mountain's pretty good about not having a lot of birds, which is good which are like little fuzz balls in your linen. Some of the coarser ones will be full of it and will never press out as smooth and all of it. Wipe the excess water off with a paper towel. Get that paper towel loose from the butt. All right, I'm ready to do a press on it. I'm gonna start it going. And I'm just putting moderate pressure with my back hand. You're going to press this till it starts steaming. It'll work. This wood will work just like a steam iron on this linen. It'll start steaming and it'll dry out and those white specks on this linen will turn back uh, white. And you'll know it's dry. Then you're ready for step two. I don't know how well you can see. The uh, color of the wood on this butt, but it's coca bowl and it's very pretty. 
but if you're going to build a queue out of coca bola you're going to have to make your butt three pieces you notice the center piece on this butt was white wood the other way will not work stop the lathe a second that's pressing pretty good I'm going to try running that on the second speed to speed this thing up. I normally recommend doing your pressing on the first speed. See how much more vibration I'm getting and I'll run it over to get it, get it warm to dry some of that water out. Go back to the slow speed. See the linen start to lighten up, son. There's some roller bearing presses out there that work real well. They're very expensive. They work well, but you still have to press it, and they do have the grooves in the wood. But I found with good linen, even though the roller bearings will get them flat real quick, this this one by two boat press. Plenty sufficient. Slide that off there. Now I have me two little pieces, two small sections of wood. It's hard to get up at the very edges. So I take these two small pieces of wood and I press right up on the edge to where I can get right up to the corner without worrying about hurting the finish. And I press that in there good and flat. I come up to the other end, do the same thing. It never hurts to run over the whole wood with it. I have pressed with just two pieces of, of dowels, whatever I have, but I've been using this oak press for a long time, and it works real well. Okay. Got that in there suitable. Now we're going to come in for the final press. We're going to soak it with starch. Just any brand spray starch. You can use it in the uh, squeeze bottle or the aerosol. Sometimes I think the aerosol is, is a little quicker and all than that. But it also, a lot of times when you're traveling around, you're throwing it in your stuff, the button gets smashed or the lid comes off and it gets smashed and it spills everywhere. It sprays all over everything in your toolbox why I'm using that other type. your hand down it, it'll feel like a nice piece of cloth. It won't feel like an individual string like nylon does or unpressed linen. And it'll really have a smooth feel to it. Some people like using a gulf wax or paraffin wax and running it on. That takes away the uh, moisture absorbing value. See that's good and tight. It's all pressed. There's no space between the strings. That's what you want to wind up with. You want to take you a little water and clean up the ends. Make sure you get all of that glue off. Take it off, put their bumper back into it, and hand it back to them all that glue wiped off. Okay, now we're going to go into a little joint work. 
First thing I'm going to do is take a bar cue and make a sneaky feed out of it. Now I've measured it, a 28 and a half, 57 inch cue, I've measured it 50. Just notice I'm putting one of the little plastic collets around it. And I'm going to run it in about so far. Snug that up. Take my wrench, my key to it, tighten it up. And I've already slid the tail stock completely off the end of the lathe. Now if you're using one of the mini micro work hustler lathes, or the work hustler, and you want to clean a shaft, you just slide the tail stock off the end of the lathe, and you freehand it out here. You have to keep a hand on it when you clean a shaft, retaper one or something. But if you ever use this lathe here, it will spoil you, and you will not want to go back to, uh, to many of the other ways, unless you already have a very large machine lathe this thing will do a lot. You've got it in your steady rest. I've got a little insert. I've put me a mark on here where I want it. Did was took a ruler and measured. Cut it on 28 and a half inches. Get me a saw blade. I'll be right back. Now I could put my uh, this in there and go in with the skew, or I could put a parting tool in this and go in with it. But you can't hardly make a parting tool as skinny as a hacksaw blade is. Sure, that's the right mark. Okay, I'm going to take and go ahead and uh, start my groove here. I'm going to put the lathe on. I'm going to try my best to go in that groove without hitting anything else. Light's turning now. You don't try to go all the way through here. Good ways through. Now I'm just going to finish it up. I have this thing mounted on the work mate, which is wonderful for being portable. If you don't care anything about being portable, bolt this whole thing down to a real solid bench where you don't get all this movement. But normally, a little vibration, a little movement like this doesn't hurt you. As long as you're not doing it while the lathe is moving. There we go. See, we have a good clean cut. We'll stop right there a second. Okay, you notice I have a uh, I have the shaft chucked up in the second steady rest. Put the lathe. Well. I'll put the lathe on the third speed. So I'm going to come in here with my tool. I've got my three. I'm going to lay these back here behind the, this where I can get this down here where I need it. Bring you in a little closer up on that. Where that's all you have is that one part there. Now I'm going to flip it on. So I've got it. Now I only stuck a 
I've got about a third of the shaft going through the headstock. That way when I start cutting this, you won't be hearing a whole lot of uh, you won't be hearing a whole lot of chatter. If you hear too much chatter, run more of the shaft through the headstock. So I've got that face off. Placed off good and flat. Now I want to slow the lathe down about to the slowest speed. You're going to do your drilling a lot slower than you do your other stuff. Now I have a little bit here. It's called a countersink drill. It's countersink drill. This will give you a good center hole to drill in a little ways with it. Always look on a chart and see I'm drilling 7 16 14. So I'm running, I can't, it's one uh, 64th under 3 8 or, or over 3 8 I'd have to go look on my chart. I just mark my bit, which one it is. It is a 2364. So I'm going to tighten this tailstock up. Now this tailstock lever action is uh, not as nice as the drill action, but this thing is all set in straight, so it will drill straight. You just want to snug that up to where there's barely enough room to drill, where it'll just barely go nice and smooth. starter hole. It's running real true. I'm going to try drilling that on one speed faster. I have a, a large metal lathe that I do most of my cube building on. And I kind of took some of the better features off of it and put it on this little one. The thing that's missing is thread cutting capability and automatic feed. set to drill one inch, a hair over an inch, no more. If you could find you some short drill bits, they would be a help to you, but they're hard to find in these oddball sizes. I'm going to uh, get up real close to where I can get the full drill out of this the one, then I'll have to reset it and go in again. dry coat, which I keep in my shops good to spray on your bits, you would stop that squilling because it would cut a little cleaner. And run it in here. inches, which just leaves plenty of room for a tail. Got 
Okay, you want to put your tap in here, 7 16 14 for this particular insert. Blow out the hole, run it up in here, start turning your shaft. You want to let the uh, loosen this screw to where it's just snug, to where it keeps it in line, but has plenty of movement, to where, to where it can all just work its way on up in here. Then you just keep turning it until you run it all the way in. When it starts getting snug, you'll know you've went about as deep as you can. It's when it's a good time to stop. I went a little far, making it hard on myself to get it back out. When you have that problem, you unscrew the uh, chuck loose from the thing, tighten the chuck down on your insert real good, and then start taking it out. Not just letting it put its own pressure, because you don't want to uh, make it come out at an angle. All right. Spin that back on the tailstock. You have a dead center on your tailstock also. It's a dead point center. I recommend using a live one though. A point one can, with metal that would be fine with a little grease, but for wood, you'll start burning the wood. Now take one of the shaft pins, and I put the insert on it, Chuck it up in the chuck. I'm going to mix a little glue. Okay, I've got the epoxy poured out here. I'm going to stir it up. Now some would put the glue in the in the uh, shaft and on the insert, and that would give you a better glue bond. Your problem with doing it that way Always lay your paper towel under all of this where you don't get it on your cross slide and such. The problem with doing it that way is that you'll wind up with uh, glue going up on the inside of the uh, thing, of the insert. It could make it where your screw won't go in very easy. Just rotate the chuck a little bit. Try and get it on every thread. I'm going to gob it on the insert, and then it'll go in and glue to those wood threads without having the excess over the end of it. Same way as before, you want the, you want the tailstock to be able to move slightly. Just running it in here. Try not to go too fast, because enough pressure to crack out the side of the shaft or butt when you're doing this particular operation right here. Okay, now we got it on there. We're going to take the chuck, take it loose, off. We're going to rotate it, clean all the glue off that area, clean it off your pan, you don't want to ruin your pan, really get the glue off. And then we'll take the pan out with a pair of flyers. I'll let that dry and we'll come back and cut it down. Okay, and we're going to come across here, we're going to try that on that speed. A lot of times I'll turn it up a little faster. I'll turn it up another speed and cut the brass. Turn it up to the third speed. If you're getting too much vibration.
so let's stick a little more back through here. If you have the vibration in too much space in, in here, it'll wind up giving you a lot more vibration. Let's shorten it up like that. Tighten it back down. Remember to keep your plastic collar on it. Tighten the steady rest back up here. Let's see if that, if that improves it any. Of that brass insert. We're not sanding the wood, just the inside of that brass insert. Pull it out. Now you have a nice insert in the shaft. Let's see how close up we can get on that. in there. I gotta take a break for a few hours and I'll come back probably tomorrow and finish up and show you how to join the butt. But always remember, do the shaft first because when you have the butt in here and you've already put the screw on the butt, then you'll be able to slide the shaft right on the end of the butt and true the two up even with each other. So always remember, make the shaft insert first. Now, if you wanted to uh, put a joint ring on this, I'm not going to since I'm making a sneaky peek for someone at my pool room. I'm going to, uh, you would just take your tool, just like a ferrule, cut you a tenon, and then once you got it cut down to the right size, then you would do one pass inward to face off the back side of the tenon. Just like joint work is nothing more than a ferrule work with a screw or an insert being put in it. The rest of it's just like ferro work, faced off flat, just like you were going to put a tip on it and cut the shoulder for the ferro to go up. Okay, now we have the, uh, the butt chucked up in there, or we cut it off. Whenever you put a, uh, you're going to put a joint on this part of the butt, always run your insert in from the back of the steady rest. That way the shoulder will go up against the end. Now I wrap a little uh, masking tape around the uh, the big part of the butt down here in the chuck to where you don't uh, scar it up. First thing we're going to do, we're going to turn the lathe on the third speed. Third speed seems to be about best for facing off. You may decide to run on the fourth speed, which is a little faster. Sometimes when you cut across brass like we did on the thing, since it's only a quarter inch tool in this lathe, it's not quite as rigid as it could be. Alright, we'll do a little pass across the front of it. Do one more light pass to make sure I really got good. Based off real good. Now we want to slow down. Now 
We're going to drill 5 16 18, so we start out with a uh, 1760 fourths bit. And we want to go pretty deep with this hole. Tighten it down. Well, we'll drill the pilot hole first. If you were uh, cutting off a ferrule, I didn't show you how to cut off a ferrule at the first time, but all you do is, if you're going to cut off a joint ring to replace one, you just come in here and cut it off. Just do passes down it. Once you have it all the way off, you face off the back just like you were cutting a tenon for a ferrule. Now some of the softer ferrules, like muchies and such, you can run a piece of leather on them and melt them off. But with the cross slide, you might as well just go ahead and cut them off because it's much easier because they'll cut off pretty plain. Get this thing where you just have a little movement in it. Got our, got our center hole started. Let's back it off. Now let's put it back in our 1764th bit. get as much drill on each round as possible. push that last little bit in with hand pressure. All right, we have our hole. Okay, I have my tap in here. I don't have a whole lot of time left on the tape. And you start running your tap in. You can even flip your lathe on to run it in. We're doing this on the slowest speed. And then you back it out. take one of my pins and then I'm going to take an insert, put the pin in the chuck. Now I'm going to leave about a five-eighths screw. Most people leave about three-quarters. I'm going to take about five-eighths of this screw, hold my fingernail against it, and run this up against it. Where I have that much of it in there. Then I'm going to take that and screw it on my lathe pin until it all butts up tight and really twist it to where it's tight. And that's what I'm going to use to run that in with. I'll stop it and put the glue, put the five minute epoxy on it. Okay, I've laid my paper towel out there. So I can put glue on the screw, all except the last few threads there. 
there is a possibility a lot of times when you start to go in with your screw that it won't go in as far as you wanted it to. On this operation, you do want to put glue in here. When you put it in there, be real careful that you don't mess your threads up because that wood is very easy to break those threads in there. I use, I normally just keep a bunch of nails or toothpicks around to mix up the glue. All right, now remember we finger pressure to where it barely slides on the lathe where it'll go in there good and straight. And we just run it up in there. See, I flip my lathe on for a second. Keep going. I'm going to take and wipe some of that glue off as I'm going in with this last turn or two all that glue off that I can. Keep going in until it's right up against it. We're going to take the chuck loose. and they're good and straight. Finish wiping that glue up. Another little hint that'll help you, if you have a sharp thumbnail, you stick it down in the first thread with the paper towel on it and wind your way back out to where you're running that paper, that towel up through every thread. Come in here, spin the lathe, do one more little face on it. When you're building a sneaky peek, you can go ahead and do it. Now what you want to do here, if you were working on a, uh, a cue with a collar on it, and you had built a shelf, like normally when I build a sneaky feet, I don't just cut one like this. I'll take a butt, trim it down thinner, and build a whole new shelf. That way I get a 58 inch cube and a really high quality piece of shelf wood. But for just building a sneaky peak, you just want to come in here with some 220 and sand these two pieces even with each other with the shelf attached. Now, if you were dealing with a normal shaft, it would be on, it would be larger than the butt normally, and then you would just come in here, go in a few thousandths, cut it down, go in a few thousandths, cut it down, go in a few thousandths, cut it down until it matched the butt perfectly. But all you do with the sneaky peak is come in here and sand it even. You turn your lathe back up to about the third speed. I'm just going to do the rough turn because you'll get the idea. Keep a hand down here on this. Then just stand the two pieces. You can also go on up the shaft a little bit if you want to make the taper a little different to where it will match the butt perfectly. See, that's got it sanded up smooth with each other and then you just go on to lighter grades of sandpaper. I want to have a little time on the tape to show you how to turn your wood, so I'm going to have to quit with the joint work. If any of you that own the tape or own one of my lathes have any questions about how to do any kind of work, 
feel free to give me a call. I'll be glad to uh, tell you whatever I know. Now I have a bud in here with the back side. You see, I have faced off here. I have cut a tenon for the size of the uh, butt plate. When I made the butt plate, I put this in the chuck, faced it off flat, faced this side off flat, drilled my three-quarter hole here for the size of the tenon. Then I drilled a one-inch hole about an eighth of an inch deep for my half inch bumper to set in. And then I came in with a, uh, a three quarter bit. And I come in with a seven eighths and drilled a hole part way, which give me an angled hole, like a V groove for the head of my screw to go in. It shows you the uh, head of the screw here. And then I have, a, I drilled a three eighths hole and then that fits over that, the screw goes in it. I also drilled and tapped a hole in the end of the screw for the bumper screw to go in. The butt plate will be on oversized just like a ferrule and then you'll cut it down to size. That's all there is to putting a butt plate on. You weight it by the longer screw. The longer screw, the more weight. I'm now going to give you a real quick demo of how to cut a taper on a butt and cut a shaft. First thing you want to do when you turn stuff on this lathe, when you're doing major turns, is cut a tenon like this on the end. That way when you chuck this up in the chuck, you have a back part for that to bottom out against, just like your shaft pin. That way it can't slip backwards into the chuck. Now if you want to cut a taper on a butt, Say you want the back of the butt 1300, you want the uh, front uh, 850 at the joint. That'll give you a few thousands to play with as you get it down to size. What you do is you tighten your tailstock down. Then you loosen the, the back screw. And the tailstock is already centered. In order to center the tailstock up, you take the pointed center, put you something pointed in your chuck, and line the two points up. That gets you in center. So what I'm doing here is I'm taking my thousandths calipers, and I'm measuring to the front of the uh, to the front of the tailstock, back to the edge of that metal on the housing part. It says a thousand eighty. So half of, uh, we got 1,300 to 850. We got 450 thousand, so we want to come 225 thousandths in. That'll be 55, 955, 855. So I want to move this over. Sometimes you'll have to tap it a little with something. Alright, I got it moving. I went just a little too far, so I want to come right up to the edge. Alright, now that's got it where you have the tailstock offset toward the front to the taper you want to cut. Now I have it chucked up in there with the tailstock offset. I've already cut the taper off the round. You have to do several little passes, you know, start in doing little passes until you get a cone. Once you have a cone, it then you stop. If you're working a square piece of wood, you, you cut the corners off with a saw where you have an octangle. Then you come and run a straight, you run down at one time. You notice I have a router mounted here on my, on here. You just take your router and make you a bracket on the side of it, put it in here. I'm going to put a half inch cutting bit in it. Three eighths is okay. If you go to a quarter, you're too fine for doing your rough cuts. Now I'll step down to an end mill bit 
for doing the very last cut and cut it real slow. And also, when you cut, once you've done your last cut with the end mill bit, you come back and you go in about 25 thousandths or 20 thousandths, depending on how thick you're going to put your finish on, and you cut your wrap groove. Always wear eye protection and ear protection when you run the router. I'm going to go ahead and do a pass down it and show you how it works. So we don't have very much time left on the film. you won't have that wood spinning on a bit. So now I've cut a taper. I can come in and clean this up with 120, 180, 220, 320, 400, 600, and I'm ready. But I'm, I'll come back in here. I'm going to go ahead and cut the uh, wrap groove on this one just to show you how to do it. I'll put me a pencil line right where I want to go to. I'm just going to guess because I'm not going to use this foot anyway. Okay. Now I'll flip it on and what I'm going to do once I touch the wood, I'm going to go in 20, I like to go about 20 thousandths because I use a pretty thick finish on that. That gives you just the right date. Center your to center your uh, tail stop back up. You want to bring it down here, lock it in, 
Lock it in tight on the top. Now, and you lock it in on the bottom. You move it until your two points line up. I've got a pointed center in the... Uh, you can use a center drill. Uh, something with a good point on it. I've got it centered back in there. I'll stop it and we want to get a shaft, cut the dowel on it where it won't slip. Yeah, I've about got the, the shaft all chucked up. Now what I've done here, I figured it out and I wanted to uh, go 300 A lot of times I'll only put finger pressure up against the end of the shaft. That way there won't be any bow in the shaft. Lock this down, slide this up against it. Okay, I'm going to go in the first 16 inches, put a ruler up here. I'm going to go down 320 thousandths to here and then run straight the rest of the way. So what I've done is I divided that in half because every thousand takes two off the whole round and that's 160. So that means, and then I put me 16 inch, 16 marks here an inch apart and I'm going to go in 10 thousandths for every inch. See I have a little wobble in the shaft but every time you do a turn it'll take it out. Now you have to remember, you want to comb the shaft first, cut it straight. When you get your rounds in, they normally won't be completely round. If you don't want to go through all this work, I have an automated setup that cuts this without me having to dial it in on my, on my larger lathe. Uh, I'll sell you the shaft lengths already ready to sand if you want to buy them from me instead of going through all of this. But I'm not going to, I don't know how the video sounded with me screaming into it, so Basically what I'm going to do is all these 16 lines, I'm going to dial in 10 thousandths for each line. When I get down here, I'm letting it run to the end. I'm just going to let you watch it. Turning the lathe on its slowest speed. Okay, I've redrawed my lines. 
What I'm going to do this time is I'm just going to go in here and take about, I'm going to go in and take three lines at a time. I'm going to take the front three lines, run to the end, come back, take the next three lines, run to the end, come back, take the next three lines, go to the end, so on until I've cut the whole thing. I probably won't have time enough on the video to show you all of the cuts, but it gives you your basic idea.
you do a major cut like this, which that's a pretty big cut that I just took through all these cuts, this would be considered about the second cut on a, on a shaft. You want to set this shaft aside for about a month. Give it at least a few weeks, then come back and do the same thing again and take it on down. I'm going to take some uh, 120 here and run over it and smooth it up a little bit. Turn the lathe up to the third speed. You can just pull those right out. Using the router instead of a stationary tool, you don't have all the whipping. As long as you turn your lathe down slow. As you can see, I've cut a taper down it. Then just start running your first uh, five. If you're going to go 10,000, that way you have a whole notch and you don't have to look. You just turn it a turn. Do your, do your five notches. Go all the way to the end. Come back, do your next five notches. But as you do those, go right down and keep following that other one. Go on a little deeper. Do the next five and go a little deeper. That way you're always following, taking a little more off the whole length. Now for cutting points in, what you do is you lock your piece of wood back here. You go ahead and cut your taper on it. You offset your tail stop until you get the right depth that you want to cut from the front of the point all the way to the back. You put your router on here. You have, you're going to have to have your bit special ground to get a good 90 degree V groove bit. Go to someone that's really good at sharpening tools. Another way to do it, which is harder, but will give you a better cut, is to go to a three-quarter or a one-inch bit like this and build you an arm that lets your router tilt where you have the corner of the bit going in, which is the way I prefer to do it. Now, once you, you cut your groove for your points, you put it in, you take you some tourniquet material like they make slingshots out of, like you wrap around your arm, Wrap your uh, cue up with cellophane where the glue doesn't get all over that. Lay your points down in it and then wrap it up real tight. Lay your uh, pieces of wood that have been cut to 90 degrees and sand it. Lay them in there and wrap that tourniquet around and around and around it. Let it glue overnight. Use Franklin type bond or one of the real good glues. And then you always make your uh, butts in three pieces. You'll cut a dowel and drill up in here just like making a joint. I use a 5 8 some use 3 quarters. I actually want more strength on my points instead of here. I think 5 8 is plenty. You slip your, you drill your 3 quarters on your bottom piece of ebony, slip it over, then you're ready to do the joint work and all like you've already seen. Do a cut down it to get it true like you just saw in your offset. Come back and cut your uh, wrap grooves. Now to do simple inlaying, you just put you a piece of uh, maple or ebony or whatever, it doesn't matter, and then you just get you a straight bit. You can buy shorter end mill bits. I would use an end mill for this operation. Get you a shorter end mill bit, put your router, mount your router to where it's going in straight, not rounded like this one would cut it a little rounded. You want the bit to be going absolutely straight. Put this in here, you lock it in at your other Put a lot of pressure on. You don't rotate your chuck. You don't have indexing on this chuck, but a lot of on this lathe head, but a lot of lathes do. You index it or draw your line, whichever way you have to do it. You turn your router on, go to the depth that you want, run your groove. Come back, run you another groove, come back, rotate it, run you another groove down with your router, and then you have you a nice inlay piece for the butt. You can cut this up into joint ring material, butt rings. And that's basically how you do it. If you want to make some fancy joint ring material, then you take a smaller piece like shaft wood and then take you a real fine, like a 132nd bit. Uh, 
get you a collet for your router to where you can put it in there or get you a little Dremel tool. A Dremel tool works fine for doing small stuff like that, probably better than the router. Run your line down it. You could make, you, I would make a foot or two of it at a time. Run it down it, however you want it. And then you've got your joint ring material. Cut it off, drill a hole in it, you're ready to go. Now for putting a finish on a cue, I normally don't finish my cues on the lathe because I don't want all the overspray over it. If you do, wrap it all up. I spray my butt and my uh, shaft together. Hold on a second and I'll get, a, I'll get one and show you. You see I have my joint rings, how I do my inlays. I spray this all the way down through here, forearm. I tape up this area. I've about finished this cue. I haven't put the wrap on it yet. And here I have a large bumper on the bottom of this one. That's not permanent. I just use that that way I can stand the cue up in the rack after I get done spraying it without the bottom getting touched. I like to use material. Delrin is the strongest, but Delrin can't take a finish. So use something like PVC, ABS, or your phenolics for your butt plates. I've got all the inlays. If you're going to try to get into inlays, you're going to have to go buy you a few thousand dollar pantograph to do it. If you figure out a way of doing this kind of work with something cheaper, please let me know. I'd like to know. Once you spray your cue, I would go to an automotive store, get some two-part or three-part acrylic urethane. Beware though, the harder to finish, the harder to polish it out. You're going to start out after you've sprayed it, you're going to sand this all down, you're going to come back and spray it again. You're going to put two or three coats on it, maybe two or three different days. And each time you're going to sand it back down. You're going to make sure it's real smooth. You want the last coat to go on just as smooth as possible. Then you'll sand any blemishes out, get it sanded all the way to 2000. Then come in with your super duty rubbing compound. Then you're going to have at least three steps. Your finesse it and your Imperial Micro Glaze. There's two or three steps in between those that you can use if you want to. Uh, I can tell you the advantages and disadvantages of, uh, of all the PPG stuff. So I've tried, I've tried their, their stuff and I know which ones are hard. The 2020 is very hard. It'll produce the best finish of any of them, but it's also real hard to polish out. I sprayed this Q with 2020 and I still have micro scratches in it that I'm going to have to really work with to get them out. It's real tough to finish. Use their DC 1100. Doesn't produce as hard a finish, but it's very easy to polish out. Their Deltron is kind of in between the two. And you'll just go at it with a rag, spin it on about the third speed, second speed, polish it out. Also for spraying cues, I recommend you just get you a good airbrush or a super good touch-up gun. Don't buy a cheap touch-up gun because it will overspray. It'll spray it too thick. Get you either a, a high dollar touch-up gun or use you an airbrush. Spray it as smooth and as light as you can. For spraying over Coca-Cola, it'll run like everything. The color will bleed over into your inlays. Spray real light coats, let them dry. It'll take you a week or two to finish a Coca Cola cube. Well, I don't know what else I can cover. The tape is about gone. I hope that you that you improve on my methods that I showed you and start turning out even some better cue work than I do. I hope the Lord blesses you as much in it as He has me, because I've made a lot of money doing cue work. A cue like this one here sells for well over a thousand dollars. And some say that that's too cheap for the amount of inlay work and detail and two shafts, etc. But I sell cues for in the set with uh, much simpler patterns of inlay for several hundred dollars. Well, I guess that's it. And happy cue building to you. And happy cue repair. If you don't know what to charge, ask me, I can tell you what I charge.
But remember, the, the money is in the, is in the repairs if you can get them. And this lathe will do it all. And if you want to set up a lathe that will do everything more automated than this one will, I have a big machine that when you cut the shaft, it has, a, it has taper bars to cut it for you. It'll cut a butt for you, the points, etc. If you want me to help you set one up like that, I can, but I warn you up front that setting one up like that will cost you, will cost you about what this one does or more than this whole lathe just to set it up. But if you have a metal lathe with, with everything on it, uh, quick change gears, etc., we can modify it. If you have a wood lathe you want to modify, I can help you modify it. Any kind of lathe that you have, you give me a call with the specs on it, and I, I can tell you what all we can make that lathe do. So again, happy Q building and God bless you.